Psalm 117 this morning. Is there a call to worship? A Psalm of Covenant Faithfulness. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol Him, all you peoples. For great is His love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's sing hymn number 561. The shortest psalm in the entire Psalter. Hymn number 561. Really, there's not much more to say than that about covenant faithfulness. of covenant faithfulness, hymns of covenant faithfulness, and now our scripture reading, which is our sermon text in Matthew chapter 5. Another example in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, beginning in verse 31 and verse 32. Jesus says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Steve, can you come lead us in prayer? Sing Psalm 40C. Psalm 40 So what do you do when everything that your culture believes and practices about a topic is dead wrong? That's sort of the question we ask ourselves quite a bit, isn't it? Well, our text today is the third example that Jesus gives as the fulfillment of the law as it is meant to be lived in the kingdom of God. We've worked our way now to from the time of early Genesis to bringing up an issue about divorce. And divorce is regulated in the law of Moses. Well, the key to understanding this text is that Jesus basically countered the entire concept of marriage and divorce and remarriage that had been accepted in his day among the Jews. If you don't understand that part of the context of where Jesus is coming from, you're not really going to understand what he has to say. But this example regarding Jesus and divorce is Jesus' way of saying that everything that they believed about marriage and divorce is dead wrong. So Jesus' example takes marriage in an upside-down world and puts it right-side up. That's how he countered the problem of a culture that believed entirely and practiced entirely wrong when it comes to marriage and divorce. And that's what you should do when everything around you seems to be upside down and wrong. Simply promote the truth and practice the right way of doing things. That's Jesus' example here in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 31. 
He says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Hard words. This is really kind of a shortened statement an abbreviated version of what Jesus taught on divorce more fully in Mark 10 and later we'll see in Matthew 19 as well, a parallel text to Mark chapter 10. So what I have to say today is, is, is a lot, basically just a review from the sermon I gave in Mark 10 in the sermon series through Mark. And I think it's important again to look at this in its right context. Jesus opens with an allusion to the law's requirement for a man to provide a certificate of divorce to his wife when he sends her away. And that's the background where you see this. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That's the law of Moses. There is a single detail in the entire law of Moses governing divorce and how it was to be done. And it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 24. We need to go and look at that to set some context as well. But realize that in the entire Old Testament, as far as the law of Moses, there is only one place that discusses divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, talks about divorce. And I think that that's really a testament to how rare divorce should be in an ideal world among God's people. You have all the law that governs all of life to the Hebrews. And you have one mention of divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Very rare in the Old Testament. But let's look at this example in Deuteronomy chapter 24 because it sets the context for what Jesus is referring to in his Sermon on the Mount. Deuteronomy chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. The law of Moses says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. It's a rather tortuous example if you think about that because generally in the law of Moses if there is something regarding adultery that was supposed to be judged, right? So what was the punishment for adultery? It was death. That's right. For Israel. And so this idea here is that there's something that is indecent found out about her, but perhaps not to the point of being demonstrable in a trial. The, there is a provision in the law of Moses for the man to send her out of his house with a certificate of divorce. And the certificate of divorce was for the protection of the woman because then everyone would understand that she is freed from that covenant marriage. In fact, some of the Jewish divorces from this particular period of Jesus says that you are free to marry whomsoever you choose. So the idea of divorce and remarriage is inseparable in the Hebrew mind, especially in Jesus' day. So it was really a protection for the woman, and we've covered that in Mark chapter 10. But it's important to recognize the situation and relevance of Deuteronomy 24 to defend covenant marriage. And Deuteronomy 24 shows that there is, there is this fallout that takes place once sin has entered into and broken down the covenant marriage in, in various ways. Deuteronomy 24 deals with, a, with the fallout of a marriage that has been broken by sin and it's not really the standard, it's not the norm, it is the exception to the norm, or it's perhaps a, uh, a legal sort of workaround to deal with a problem. 
So it's important to understand that about De- Deuteronomy chapter 24, it's really dealing with the fallout of something indecent in a marriage. Now, here's the important thing to think about Deuteronomy 24 and where Jesus is going with this. God followed the law of Deuteronomy 24. Do you realize that? There's a reason that Deuteronomy 24 has a provision for divorce. Who's it for? It's for God's use when His covenant people become indecent toward Him. So when we look at Deuteronomy 24, we've got to understand the bigger story of what happens in Israel's history. Did you know that God followed the law of Deuteronomy 24? God wrote Israel, His betrothed wife, because I look at Sinai as the betrothal of Israel, the beginning of the marriage process. God wrote Israel, His betrothed wife, a certificate of divorce because of her unfaithfulness to God and her adulteries with false gods and foreign nations. Jeremiah chapter 3 talks about this specifically in verse 8. In fact, there's a whole book in the Old Testament that deals with this. But Jeremiah 3 says it very clearly in verse 8. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. And that's what Bo's been talking about with the northern kingdom. Speaking of the northern kingdom, God gave the northern kingdom Israel a certificate of divorce and sent her out of his house. That was the Assyrian captivity. Yet the Lord did not give up on Israel after giving her a divorce. Even in the divorce from the betrothal covenant, God made promises to Israel to still marry her. Bo has been talking about the patience of God. Well, if you start studying Deuteronomy chapter 24, you'll see that the patience of God is more than just breathtaking or frustrating or anything else. It's beyond comprehension that the husband sends his unfaithful wife out of his house and yet gives her promises. Hosea is that little book that talks about the divorce of God that he gives to Israel, the northern kingdom. And what does Hosea promise in Hosea 3? After God had declared that Israel is not my wife and I am not her husband, Hosea 3 goes on to say, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lithic of barley. Then I told her, You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will live with you. Why is that important? Because if the northern kingdom goes and marries another man, God cannot come back and marry her again. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. There's going to be a marriage. The one that God sent out of his house with a certificate of divorce is still going to be pursued by the husband. Israel was called to remain chaste in her separation from God so that she could be married to God once again at the time of reconciliation during the last days. So even God follows the law of Deuteronomy chapter 24. And that's really what I think the law is all about. It's ultimately about Israel and God's covenant marriage to Israel beginning with the betrothal covenant at Sinai. But with Deuteronomy chapter 24, if you follow God's story, the certificate of divorce was for the purpose of someday ultimately bringing his wife back into covenant relationship with him. 
It was for the purpose of rescuing his marriage to Israel, specifically that the northern kingdom is sent out of the land into captivity. God loves his bride that much. So that's the key you've got to understand for Deuteronomy chapter 24 is it's telling the story in the law of God himself and his covenant marriage to Israel beginning with the betrothal. But it was necessary because of sin, right? If Israel isn't unfaithful, she doesn't receive a certificate of divorce. And Jesus said it was given to the people, this provision in the law of Moses was given to the people because of their hard-heartedness. But the ideal for marriage was to be for life. And God lived out that ideal through his own sacrificial giving of himself in Christ so that true Israel gets married to God in Jesus Christ at the end. And along comes the story of Joseph and Mary. Right? That's a wreck from Israelite context. From that culture, that's a wreck. You have Joseph, the righteous man, and Mary, who is found to be pregnant. Does that sound familiar in Israel's history? It looks like Israel's history. And what's the question that Joseph has to deal with? Is Joseph going to be dealing with, do I divorce her or do I not divorce her? Or is Joseph asking the question about something else? How do I divorce her? If you read the story in Matthew, the question is not whether or not Joseph is going to divorce Mary. The question is, how is he going to divorce her? And the conclusion is that he is a righteous man, so he's going to divorce her quietly to lessen the shame for her sake. That is, of course, until it is revealed to him from God that this thing was necessary and this was God's doing, not someone else's doing. So we have the whole story of Israel and God coming back up in Joseph and Mary. And Joseph, of course, breaks that traditional context and continues to marry Mary. That sounds weird, but he is a godly man exercising sort of the mimicking who God is and actually going to follow through with his marriage to Mary, which is a symbol of Israel. So that's the story, and it gets a little bit confusing and complex because you've got to sort out this Israel along the way. There's this idea that there's the wicked in Israel and the faithful in Israel, right? And somehow, at the end of the age, all of this separating is going to take place to where the wicked are cut out of Israel and the blessed are going to stay in Israel. That's what the story about the uh, sheep and the goats is all about. The gathering at the last days where there's a separation going on. The wheat and the tares. Another example of this purification of Israel to where those who do not remain faithful to God are cut out and those who do remain faithful to God in Christ Jesus remain in Israel. And it gets real complicated. You get the book of Revelation. It talks about a harlot. People have talked about the book of Revelation being a covenant judgment or covenant document against adulterous Jerusalem, apostate Jerusalem. So there's two Israels going on. You've got to kind of pay attention to which way it's going. It gets confusing. But that's how Deuteronomy 24 fits into the story of God's betrothed covenant with Israel and his marriage completed at the consummation of the ages to true Israel. And again, I've said this before, but God is a one-woman man. If you follow the story... Pay attention to the detail. It becomes very clear that this is coming into fulfillment with Christ and the church. But what's going on in Jesus' day? I mean, we see Joseph and Mary and how weird that is because the natural assumption in that day is that Joseph is what? He's got to divorce Mary. It was the norm. And yet he doesn't. What's going on in Jesus' day that causes Jesus to take this Deuteronomy 24 reference and make a contrast. Well, to see that, we have to go to Matthew chapter 19. 
And this will look familiar to you because it's a parallel text to Mark chapter 10. But this really throws a lot of light onto why Jesus presented this the way he did. In Matthew chapter 19, we read that when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Whenever they come to ask Jesus questions, it means there's a debate going on in the background. That they're trying to basically pin Jesus down to one side of the debate for their own purposes. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Deuteronomy 24. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. Do you see how that works? They had taken a provision of the law that permitted them to do something in a certain specific case and they made that to be as if Moses was commanding them to divorce their wives. And there was no such thing. What is a permit? A permit is to do something that otherwise would be illegal. So in the law, as it was originally intended, it was always illegal to divorce your wife. But because of the hardness of the hearts and because sin was involved, there was this provision. And so, by the way, Jesus is weighing in on this debate, this contemporary debate that was going on in the Jewish culture of the day. There was the school of Shammai rabbis who said that divorce was justified only on unchastity by the wife which we generally think of as sexual unfaithfulness, but they had it bigger. For example, in the school of Shammai, if a wife went out in public with her hair down, that was considered unchastity and grounds for divorce. If a wife spun thread in public with armpits bared, that was another example. If she had bare armpits in public, that was unchastity, grounds for divorce. So they were considered to be the conservatives of the day, but it was sort of not the way we think of as sexual unfaithfulness. If a wife were to bathe in a place where men were, mixed bathing, that was unchastity, grounds for divorce. These were the conservatives. Okay, They still had plenty of room for divorce. But they were conservative on a relative sense because the Hillel school of rabbis were far more open to divorce for any reason on any displeasing grounds. They would emphasize that phrase in Deuteronomy 24, if you find something displeasing in your wife, send her out of your house with a certificate of divorce. That's how they read it. So, divorce was strictly a husband's prerogative and he could do so for any reason including burning dinner. That was one of the examples. That was grounds for divorce. And realize that divorce was strictly a husband's prerogative. There was no wife's right to divorce the husband in this Jewish culture. There was no legal hearing before a court that was necessary. Uh, marriage was not viewed as property of the civil magistrate to regulate or dispense. And there was no provision for a woman to divorce her husband in Jewish law. There was in Roman law, and we see examples in Mark chapter 6 where Jesus applied the same rules for a wife divorcing her husband 
and a husband divorcing her wife. He applied the same principles for both. Mark was more of a general context. Matthew is written to a Jewish audience that was used to this culture. But both Hillel and Shammai schools of rabbis' teaching granted the right of divorce if a woman remained childless as well. So continued infertility, the failure to produce heirs, was also grounds for divorce in both schools. And it's interesting, if you read Josephus, Josephus has his own description of how he handled his own divorce in his day. Um, Josephus, the famous historian, wrote this about his story. He says, At this time I sent away my wife, being displeased with her behavior. Then I took as a wife a woman from Crete. And Josephus was a trained Pharisee. Obviously on the Hillel side of this debate. In fact, in his commentary on Deuteronomy chapter 24, Josephus writes, The man who wishes to be divorced from his wife for whatever cause, and among people many such may arise, must certify it in writing. Whatever you want is what you get. These were the Pharisees. So that's the culture. That's where the culture was in Jesus' day. And it's not that really that much different in our day because we have a culture of easy divorce as well. In some respects, it was easier in Jesus' day because they didn't have to deal with the court system to the degree that we do. So there wasn't an impediment there uh, as far as how to separate property and, and deal with protections for the women, etc., etc. In fact, it was so strange that Jesus would come and present this radical idea about marriage. Notice what his disciples say in verse 10. After he explains and sets covenant marriage right side up, what do the disciples say? The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. This is too radical, Jesus. It was radical to the accepted customs of that day that were completely upside down. So when you read our text today, realize that what Jesus is teaching against is easy divorce because to him, easy divorce is easy adultery. And of course, adultery carried a severe penalty according to the law. And this was a legalistic culture. They papered over their decisions with legal documents thinking it was fine to divorce their wives so long as the paperwork was in order. So long as you give her a certificate of divorce so she can go marry someone else, that's perfectly fine. Even going so far as to say that Moses commanded them to divorce their wives. So Jesus confronted that form of legalism by affirming the abiding nature of covenant marriage. What he's saying is the paperwork doesn't matter. Except for certain specific instances, the paperwork doesn't change the reality of covenant marriage. They had made covenant marriage to be virtually meaningless in terms of its abiding promise and deep commitment for life. They had become ungodly, right? Because when when God betrothes himself to Israel, he is committed. And yet they were making covenant marriage to be meaningless as far as covenant promises and deep commitments. A lot like the oaths and the swearing that we're going to see next. They had made their word to be meaningless. And Jesus comes along and he says that covenant marriage is more profound even than the will of a husband or in the case of a wife divorcing a husband, even more profound than the will of a wife. The abiding validity of a covenant in God's sight continues on regardless of the paperwork except for the case of covenant unfaithfulness. And I think we see this developed more with Paul later in the New Testament what that means. Covenants can be broken, but they cannot be dissolved for light and transient reasons. And note where Jesus lays the blame. Who does Jesus blame? Matthew 5, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. In Jewish culture at this time, who's generally blamed for adultery? The woman. You see that in the case with the the woman who's going to be stoned for adultery. Jesus turns it around and blames the men. It is the men who cause the wives to become adulterous, adulteresses, and it's the man who marries the divorced woman who commits adultery in God's sight. Again, the marriage covenant is more fundamental than legal documentation. And this would have been a slap in the face of the Pharisees. He's calling the Pharisees adulterers. It's one of those examples of what Jesus meant when he said that your righteousness must surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees to see the kingdom of God. This is an example. Well, how do you do it? Here's how you do it. Take your marriage covenant seriously and your righteousness will surpass that of the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So we have taught this many times in many different ways in this congregation. And we all come from many different backgrounds with a lot of history in our culture that is as upside down as in Jesus' day. But this is what Jesus taught us following up on the rest of the Bible. Covenant marriage is a big deal. The families here understand that reality. And you young people, you need to understand it as well as you near the marrying age. This marriage covenant is designed by God to be for life. Forever. Right? Even when everybody around you doesn't believe that, that's the reality of covenant marriage. So move forward only when you have the maturity to understand that and the sober-mindedness to consider what that means for the rest of your life. A marriage done God's way can be the greatest blessing on your life, and if it's done badly, it can wreck your life in ways that you cannot even imagine. So pay attention. To all of us, I think we should recognize that these standards for marriage can only be met as we live out the gospel. And it's tempting in our day, and these are the culture that we live in, especially the Christian culture that we live in, it's tempting in our day to try to use you know, civil law, just pass more laws, to protect marriage, right? To defend holy marriage to bolster and encourage Christian marriage in a culture that prefers not to follow Jesus. That's where Christian culture is today, looking for the government to help protect and defend marriage. And it just won't work. In a sense, what we see with a trend today, and it's understandable as a reaction, because there are others who want to do certain things with marriage, quote-unquote, Right, But in a sense, it's merely an attempt to use one form of legalism to counter the legalism of the scribes and the Pharisees. And here's a question for you. Is covenant marriage as God designed it and as Jesus taught it really for those who are not in covenant with God through the gospel of Jesus? Is it really for those people? I mean, to the degree that they want to mimic something that's beautiful and glorious, and we see unbelievers who can remain faithful in marriage, to the degree that they want to copy or have something that believers have, that does happen. But I really don't think that this kind of covenant marriage is for unbelievers. Maybe they'll call it marriage, but does that really make it covenant marriage? I mean, this is the way language works. You just put on a name, right? And we have it. Well, not exactly. Government can't make it, and government can't break it. Because covenant marriage simply is. 
It has been and it will be. When a husband and wife decide to live it out, there is nothing that the civil government can do about it. And if a husband and wife decide not to live it out, there's nothing that the civil government can do to stop the breakup. It transcends political policy. And yet, when God's people show the example of covenant marriage to the world, then our example is a beacon of gospel light. What's it saying? What does a faithful covenant marriage say? It tells the story of God and his people. The true story of Christ and the church. So you won't have that blessing outside of Christ and the church no matter what the government says about marriage and divorce. Covenant marriage is one of the most profound ways that we show the kingdom of God to the world. Be careful. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you and praise you for making us, for giving us the breath of life, for making us your people. We thank you and praise you for the blessings that you give to us, our families, our loved ones, the community of God's people here that we have to fellowship and to share things with and to rely upon. We just pray that you give us strength now as we go from this place in a world that is very confused, even to the point of calling things marriage, which aren't. We pray that you strengthen us and make us your priests in your kingdom. Give us our ministry. Give us blessing in our ministry and success in our ministry as we show the gospel through our marriages. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.